Well, hello, DEC Young Leaders, and happy sunny Thursday. I know it's the middle of February. Work with me. We've got a brilliant, sunshiny day. I'm Steve Gregorian, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club. It's great to see you all today. I want to start with a couple of quick announcements. First, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for continuing to support the DEC with your membership and by participating in our free programs. I also want to take a brief moment to thank the terrific DEC sponsors for their continued support of our mission, and you are seeing these companies on your screen. Finally, we've got a really busy schedule of events for the remainder of February, and March is crazy, and we've got a few more fun surprises in store as well. And I think we've got something for everybody, so check it out, make your reservation, and we hope to see you often in the next few weeks. Today, we're going to spend time together where, like all young leader meetings, we learn from successful executives and grow our DEC member networks. We do want to see your smiling faces, so video ons and mics muted, please. If you would like to ask a question of our guest speaker, please use the chat box to let us know, and I'll call on you uh, to deliver your live question in the final portion of today's meeting. So I want to get started. Our special guest today is Wright Lassiter. Wright is president and CEO of Henry Ford Health System, where he oversees an almost $7 billion system. Wright has nearly 30 years of experience working in large, complex health systems, including stints in Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, and Oakland, California. Wright holds a master's in healthcare administration from IU, go Hoosiers, and a bachelor's in chemistry from Lemoyne College in Syracuse, Go Dolphins, you see I did my homework. If you're a basketball fan, college basketball fan like me, you'd like to know Wright played basketball at Lemoyne under one of my favorite all-time head coaches, John Beeline, who later coached obviously at University of Michigan. Wright is extremely active in the community and most importantly to me is a valued board member of the DEC. So Wright, really great to see you today. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be with you and be with the young leaders. Thank you. First, I want to say thank you to you, Wright, and all your healthcare heroes at Henry Ford for taking such good care of all of us. Well, I appreciate it, Steve. And, you know, anytime, anytime someone tells me thank you, um, it's an opportunity for me to say thank you to 30, 30, nearly 35,000 team members at Henry Ford that have been leaning into the community and providing support during this pandemic. And so I wanna just give a shout out to all of our healthcare heroes and say that uh, I'm so grateful for all the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and thank you. Hear, hear, wholeheartedly agree, thank you. So right, the topic you chose today was leading through a global pandemic and we'll get to that, but I wanna start with your career path. So maybe just tell us about your journey and it's always interesting to hear about some key moments along the way. Thanks, Steve. So. So my journey is this, you know, I, as, as you introduced me, uh, you know, I, I run a $7 billion healthcare company today. And, and so I guess I start out by saying that uh, when I was in college, uh, in high school beforehand, uh, I didn't think that, uh, you know, I'd be in my uh, 50s doing what I'm doing today. Um, uh, so you, uh, you mentioned to the crowd that I've got a, a degree in chemistry. And so I do uh, have a degree in biology and a degree in, in philosophy as well. And so you know, I was thinking about medicine as my career path um, uh, when I was in college. And, and when I initially left college, I spent a couple of years in medical school and um, would tell the audience that I took a sabbatical from medical school, I thought would be a year and then I go back and finish up. And I did some research in biomedical sciences um, during that time. And, uh, and I never went back to medical school. Um, I ended up getting uh, introduced to the CEO of a healthcare system in Dallas, Texas, uh, back in 1989. And um, and sort of unbeknownst to me, um, during that conversation on a Saturday morning, uh, it ended up uh, turning into a job offer about five days later. Um, and so, you know, uh, I, I didn't think that this was something that I would ever pursue. And honestly, I, I never even thought about people running healthcare systems and hospitals and that sort of thing as I was growing up, even though my mother was a nurse. So, so I began my career um, um, on the IT side of healthcare, um, working on a project uh, back in the from 1990 to 92, uh, trying to create a paperless hospital system in, in Dallas, Texas. And so that was my first foray into, into healthcare. Um, I was not an IT person. I don't have a background in, in IT per se, but, um, but I had a background in science. I had worked with doctors. I understood the process. And so I was hired to work with 
with the physicians that what, what now is Dallas Methodist Health System and trying to create a paperless hospital system back in, in 1990. So that's how I started out in healthcare. Um, and I enjoyed it so much uh, that, uh, you know, with some support from the leadership in that organization, I, I left after about 30 months and went to grad school at Indiana University, as you heard, to get a degree in healthcare administration. And, um, and that health system hired me back uh, to uh, start my official um, healthcare administrative career um, in the early 90s. So, um, so I began there and I spent uh, about 11 years at, at my first healthcare system and honestly sort of thought in many ways that that might be my first and only employer because I, I was pretty loyal to the place that sort of introduced me to healthcare and then you know, opened the door for me to get started as an administrator. Um, but I spent time at that, for, at that first organization sort of going from being a kind of a junior administrator uh, to being a vice president of operations for the largest hospital in that system and, um, and then left there after about 11 years and went on to Fort Worth, Texas, just the other side of the Metroplex uh, to be a senior VP of operations for, uh, for a healthcare system that was serving the Fort Worth, uh, Texas region. Um, and then, you know, honestly, I would tell you that after about... Uh, it was about 30 months uh, there, I, um, I got recruited to, to my first CEO role. And so I left Texas in 2005, now 16 years ago, to, to, to uh, start my first CEO role running a healthcare company uh, based in the Bay Area of California, based in Oakland, California. And so I, I led uh, Alameda Health System for, for about a decade uh, before being recruited here to Michigan um, to, to the Henry Ford job. Um, and so, you know, I'm different than a lot of folks in that uh, I've only I've only worked uh, for three healthcare systems over about a, about a, a 30 year span. Um, I've had lots of jobs in those organizations, from you know, from a, being a junior administrator to being a little bit more than a junior administrator to being you know a senior administrator. Um, and then I guess I would also tell you that um, I didn't begin this path um, with the explicit desire that I had to be the CEO one day. That was sort of never my 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 goal. I, mean, I, I always wanted to have a, a significant role and to to have impact in the organization, but but never really set an explicit goal for you know I want to be the CEO. And when I um, went after my first CEO role, um, I was uh, encouraged by a mentor uh, who called me one day and said uh, to me, uh, and she really challenged me because she said, you know, right, it's time for you to be a CEO. And I said to her. Yeah, I hear you, but you know, I haven't set arbitrary goals where I need to be a CEO in month, in year five or year seven or year ten, et cetera. And uh, and she sort of chastised me. Um, and she was a she was not only a mentor, she was a good friend of my mother's. And so you know, every now and then, you know, she would say things like, you know, I think I need to talk to your mother about you because uh, I need to make sure that you listen to what I'm saying. And obviously, I was an adult, and so that was that was a little bit of a you know kind of a false you know clarion call. But nevertheless, you know, she badgered me into. Uh, I need you to respond to this uh, search firm about a role in California that I think you'd be perfect at. Um, and, uh, and so I, I ended up doing it and, uh, and leaving my second, uh, my second stop in my career much earlier, much faster than I thought I was going to leave, you know, after frankly, you know, um, not, not even three years, about two and a half years. Um, and so I was always one who sort of believed that uh, like you shouldn't hop around too much. And so I'm a, you know, my, my parents, so my grandparents always told me I had an old soul. And so I know like in today's world, the notion of, of moving around a lot isn't that foreign to folks and people move around quite a bit, you know, and oftentimes folks have two or three different careers, you know, in, in their lifetime. Um, and I, I kind of had a little, a little bit of an old school approach and thinking that, uh, you know, if you get to a place that treats you well, where you are advancing and, and you're being respected, well, just like, you don't need to like go anywhere, right? Um, especially if you got a lot of challenge in front of you, which I did and frankly, all the roles that I had leading up to me being the CEO of my first organization. Um, and so then I've been here for about six years and um, I came here explicitly um, to transition with the prior CEO. And so I was hired by the, by the board to be the transition uh, CEO for a CEO that was retiring at the time. And so uh, that, that was a bit, little bit unusual as well because uh, uh, oftentimes people say, you know, if you've been in the seat of the CEO, like you're not going to share that, that, thr that throne with someone else, uh, you know, in a transitional period. But, um, uh, but when I saw sort of what was happening in Detroit and, and what impact Henry Ford could make to what was happening in, in Detroit and in Michigan, it was really attractive to me. So that's a, uh, maybe a, a quick synopsis of, uh, of the journey that I've been on. See. Yeah, that's great. Well, certainly we all learned the lesson, don't mess with mama. So I'm glad you took her friend's advice. Uh, 
what other career lessons have you learned around uh, through your journey? You know, I would tell you that um, uh, probably the most impactful lesson that I learned fairly early on was the importance of the team that surrounds you. You know, um, I got a lot of responsibility relatively fast in my in my career. And so early on, you know, success was really around how hard I could work and how much I could do sort of directly. And as I began taking on a lot of responsibility and realized that I had a lot of folks, a lot of other leaders now under my charge, you know, it was really clear that it's not about how hard I work. It's really about how, how the collective us get done the things that, that we have on our priority list or our goals um, in support of the overall organization. And, and honestly, that was, um, that was a lesson that, um, that um, I had to really focus on learning because um, I, I was always one who believed as, a, as an athlete and, and as a, you know, at, in academics and in my early career that you know, the success was about you know, how hard I worked and how much I got done. And, um, and as, you, as you move into you know, mid-level management and then senior roles, it's really much more about um, how much you get done through others. And so you know, that was a, a key lesson. And then I think um, stakeholder support, uh, you know, in the healthcare business, especially if you're working on the administrative side, a lot of your success is predicated in how well you're able to bring key stakeholders on. And so in, in my world, it was a lot about partnerships with physicians and how you get physicians to understand what's necessary for success, um, not just the, the administrative team, but the folks who are actually delivering the product or service, you know, in a healthcare business. And so, um, and, and that's unique at times, especially if they are separate individuals, separate entities employed separately, having individual goals that might be separate and, and apart from what might be the goals that you, that your organization might set. And so the sort of notion of how do you sort of share the stage, how do you align goals, how do you align vision, and then how do you create sort of stakeholder support to get things done, are some of the key things that, that, that I've learned. And, and then probably the last thing I would just say as a leader, most important thing is to be able to listen. Um, so it's not always so important what you say. Oftentimes, it's much more important, more, much more important what you hear um, from others as you're trying to figure out, you know, how do you have impact and how do you have success and what you're trying to accomplish. Thanks, right. I want to veer to um, the topic, which is um, leading through the pandemic. So certainly, all of our business lives have been impacted by, by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, people in your industry have an enormous burden to take care of the rest of us. So I want to talk about that. How does a large, complex organization like Henry Ford prepare for something like we're going through? You know, <laughs> It's funny, when, when, when I'm asked that question, oftentimes my first answer is you don't because you, uh, no one ever sort of expects that you're going to have the kind of global interruption that we had beginning, you know, frankly, January in some parts of the world uh, and, you know, a little bit on the West Coast in Washington. And then certainly from, from March, from late February uh, on and in, in the state of Michigan from March on. So, so, you know, we prepare constantly for, crises, you know, we're always involved in, in, um, in doing preparation around emergency preparedness and, and crisis management and sort of thinking about, you know, if there is some mass casualty event, if there's some mass event, how do you respond? Um, and normally when that happens, the healthcare systems really prepare for individual parts of their company to respond. And so under normal circumstances, like most of the emergency preparedness that we do is about there is a crisis in the city of Detroit. So the Henry Ford Hospital is gonna lean in to be in crisis mode, or there is a challenge in, in um, Clinton Township in Macomb County. And so, you know, Henry Ford Macomb Hospital is gonna lean in to going into, into emergency preparedness mode. And that incident command center is gonna get launched and, and the rest of the system will watch and provide support to the portion of the system that is engaged in the crisis. Um, and while we do a little bit of, of preparation where you bring, have to bring multiple parts of your system to bear, you know, the, the short answer is we don't prepare for every hospital to be overrun by an infectious disease. Um, we don't prepare for 90% um, uh, or in some cases, 100% of your critical care capacity to be, to be um, taken up by a particular problem, right? Um, um, I'd say, you know, we, we, you didn't prepare for the global supply chain to be interrupted in a way su such that um, um, 
senior leaders who are generally not involved in supply chain like myself are on phone calls at two or three in the morning, you know, in the Far East, um, trying to arrange uh, with our CFO and our treasurer for a plane load of, of, uh, of PPE to get shipped here and to be able to make it through customs and not get confiscated and actually be able to go to us and then and then to sort of think about how might we help support other other health systems in Michigan or the Midwest region with you know with uh, you know a 50 million piece order of X um, that uh, that we can't even store anywhere right because that's not what we're used to so you know the short answer is you don't really prepare um, but having said that you know oftentimes you're called into action to do something that you weren't that you didn't practice for. Um, and, and so, you know, we did something that uh, we had never done in the history of our organization. <clears throat> and that is every hospital's incident command center was activated um, at the same time. And, and then we, we launched a system incident command center to try to manage issues that could not get managed within individual hospital markets. Uh, and that's something we had never ever done before, frankly. And so we had practiced all kinds of scenarios we had not practiced a scenario that there was a global pandemic. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think back to, uh, you know, in every crisis, there's tons of silver linings that come out of it. And, and while no one would ever want to have to live through 2020 again, live through what we lived through in terms of the global pandemic at that moment, or even to, and today, um, but I would tell you that um, our, our incident command structure worked marvelously. And um, there was never a time as I, as I roam our organization and, and, and talk with our staff, you know, the thing that, that worries you the most as a leader when you know people are, are, are looking to you for leadership is to make sure that your team always feels safe and always feels like they were supported with what they needed. And, you know, I've heard, you know, consistently by our team members that they were um, so thankful for the support that they felt they received from the organization during the crisis. Now, having said that, we had leaders at times who were, who were um, under a lot of stress, um, you know, but the, but the staff who were doing the work never felt it. But there were times when we were a day or two away from running out of, of Supply X. And, you know, happily, we had community partners, you know, on, on one faithful day, um, I was talking to Aaron Tellum at the, with the Pistons and talking about, you know, some of our challenges. And... Um, Four or five hours later, Arn had mobilized four box trucks that the Pistons owned, and they were on the highway heading to Cleveland to pick up um, some PPE uh, from a from a health system in, in Ohio that had committed to letting us borrow some of their inventory because we were a couple of days away from running out and not com not comfortable with the supply chain we had. Or similarly. Um, you know, folks driving out to Kalamazoo to get gowns when when the gown uh, supply was was next to nothing in Southeast Michigan because we were being hit pretty hard. Kalamazoo, Lansing, Grand Rapids wasn't hit as hard. And so we were relying on. And so I would tell you that never have, have we had senior executive meetings, um, honestly, in my entire career, where we were having conversations about that. Um, at no point in time, you know, I was on the phone um, on several occasions with senior members of the of the Trump administration who were handling logistics, whether it's uh, uh, testing logistics or PPE logistics. And I'm sitting at this desk here with, uh, with a 11 by 17 uh, spreadsheet of every PP item we had, what our burn rate was, when we were likely going to be running out and talking to, you know, federal officials about, you know, why we needed X when at, at, at the moment that we needed it. And so those are the kinds of things that you don't prepare for, frankly. Um, but, but it's what you have to do to sort of get through it. And then maybe lastly, I would say that, you know, the other thing that I was very focused on during this pandemic was how do you communicate to an organization um, in a very transparent manner so that people understand what's happening, but you don't also create undue, um, undue panic or undue uh, worry that, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I don't want to come to work today because, you know, things are a little too crazy. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, it, it was a fascinating time to, um, to do what we do. And, and we were doing all of that when our state was shut down. And when, you know, the, the view was, if you're, um, you know, people think of all of us as essential workers, but, you know, what folks may not realize is that like most of our administrative offices have been pretty much vacated since the end of March of last year, because the goal was keep humanity away from each other, if, if at all possible, if they can work virtually. So 
also trying to do a lot of this work. I mean, obviously our, our care team never left the hospitals. Um, our on-site administrators never left their offices, but much of our uh, corporate administrative team, the folks that I spend most of my time with and a lot of our support service team um, are doing all their work now virtually like, like many of the, the audience are, are doing. So that was also a little unique. Sounds very intense. And thank you for going through that for all of us. So I wanna make sure we leave a couple minutes for audience questions. So folks use the chat room if you got a question for Wright. I'm gonna ask you, Wright, um, one last chance here before we take those audience questions, um, any additional advice to our young leader members, whether it's life advice, career advice, the floor is yours, maybe a minute or two, please. Yeah, yeah I would, so a um, quick comment that I'd make to Steve is, um, I always think it's really, really important to focus on impact. Um, when I'm talking to young leaders, um, I, I always stress, you know, as human beings, we like to focus on things that 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 are not unimportant, but sometimes aren't completely tied to our overall, you know, professional and personal satisfaction. And so, you know, when folks say, well, you know, tell me like, so give me give me advice on how to get to be a CEO in 10 years of my career or five years of my career or whatever. And and I say, you know, I'll give you advice and I'll give you my best thoughts about that. But I would honestly tell you, um, when I didn't focus on the title, you know, uh, my escalation in my career was pretty fast. And, um, and, um, and I don't think that if I had decided the day I graduated from graduate school that I want to be a CEO at point X, that it would have happened any faster than, than the, the approach that I took was always really focusing on what impact am I providing? Um, am I delivering value in a significant way that, that my organization sees? Um, and, um, and are you in the right organization that matches with your, with your personal values and with what makes you feel good? And the last thing I would always tell people is, um, I say, you know, work hard, because I believe in life that life's about working hard, um, but I also believe that life's about playing harder. And so I tell people to have balance, and what I really mean by, by that is have balance. And so, you know, depending upon what it takes for you to, to uh, restore yourself, make sure you're doing that. Like, don't just focus on working hard and getting to the next rung on the ladder, because at some point in time, if you're, if you're not creating the sense of, of rebuilding your own, your, own, um, your own self and your own resilience, you'll burn out and you'll not be your best. And so those are a couple pieces of advice I give to the, to the audience. That's terrific. We've got uh, a few minutes left and um, I'm not sure who sent this question in. So I'm just going to read it and ask you maybe just take a minute to respond on this. Okay. You talked about surrounding yourself with a strong team. What advice or insights can you share with us who are also managing teams or one day aspire to assume leadership roles? Um, so, you know, the first thing that I would say is that when you're, when you're developing a team, you want to develop a team that has diverse thought. Um, I'm a big believer in that group think is interesting, but, you know, but, but probably boring and, 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 and less than optimally effective. And so if you have a group of folks who completely think alike and who never disagree, you probably don't have an effective team or you have people who aren't being honest with each other. And so, and so it's really important to acknowledge what your skill sets are. And then how do you build folks around you that have complementary skill sets? And so, you know, don't be afraid to think, you know, if I'm weaker in X, that I, that I get someone on my team who's stronger in that than I am. Um, and so it's, it's really important in developing a team to understand who you are, what your strengths are as a leader, and then to build around that and to not be afraid to build, to build in you know, a little bit of healthy tension on your team. And that if you're not having some healthy tension and having disagreement and debate, then your team is not optimally effective in my mind. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Loiza, would you like to unmute yourself? And I know you've got a question. Are you able to unmute or does Christina, there you go. Oh, did, I'm sorry, did you see, say Louisa? Yeah, go ahead, yes. Okay, I, um, that, thank, you for, thank you for the answer, right? Um, a quick follow-up question to that is, what if you're not able to pick the team that you're leading? Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so Steve, I'll just say that I know this face. Um, um, we've had a little interaction before, so I'm, I'm happy to see Louisa on the call. So, you know, Louisa, the first thing I would say is, that, you know, when you, when you uh, inherit a team, um, the first thing you have to do is assess the team and understand what strengths you have and what opportunities for improvement you have. Um, 
And then once you do that, if you see gaps between what the team can deliver versus what you need to deliver, it is really important to sort of understand, so what's my plan to address that? Does that mean that I need to make a change on the team? Does that mean that I need to change responsibilities so that I can shift you know, responsibilities from, you know, from person X to person Y, because person Y has a better set of skills to do some of the things that I need. So how do you address that? Or do you simply have a situation where you have some of the wrong members on the bus? And, um, and you know, I, I tell young leaders that that's not a horrible scenario. It just means that you have to make change and right. And it's, but, but, it, but, but it's, it's, um, but the most important thing there is to be clear with, with folks where you have a gap to let them know that, that we really need X and here's what it appears that you're able to do. Um, and then how do you wanna address, you know, you have to understand whether there's a willingness to sort of do something different, right? If they can produce X, but you need Y, then you have to have a, you have to have a conversation with that individual around, so are you willing to do Y versus X? Cause I really need X, so I need X plus, you know, plus something. Um, and if the answer is yes, I'm really willing, then, then you get into, okay, so, do, um, what's preventing you from getting there? Is it skills? Is it training? Is it clarity of, you know, responsibility? Is it, are there barriers that you as a leader can help take out of their way, obstacles and take out of their road so they can get there? Um, uh, and, and, or is it that, you know, I just don't have the skills to do what you need me to do. If that's the case, then the question is, so can I get, can I help you get those skills and are you willing to, to attain them? You know, and the answer is no, then it's a fairly, it's a fairly clear answer, which is, okay, then you need a new person on that bus, right? If the answer is, yeah, I have the skills, but I don't have the will or the interest, say it's the same outcome, then I need someone new on the bus. And so, you know, when I've, when I've come into new roles, I've, I've always sort of started out by saying to folks, here is the expectation. And if you're a leader uh, on the team, um, it's okay if you decide, I don't want to do that it's just not okay for you to be in the role that you're in and make that decision. Um, and so you're, so I'm okay with you making that decision, but then there are consequences of the decision, right? Um, and so if you tell me I'm willing to do it and I think I'm able to do it, here's what I need from you, then I do my best to try to provide that so they can be successful. If there's no will or there's no skill and no desire to get there, then, you, then sooner than later, I would suggest you have conversations around, I'm gonna to need to do something different here. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Lisa. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. I figured you would like a friendly face, right? So we've got time for one more question. Matt Zellman, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure. Thanks, Steve. I uh, just want a disclaimer. I'm from Blue Cross. So I uh, just wanted to know if for best practices uh, with COVID care and processes, were you able to share anything with other Southeast Michigan hospitals or did you keep it within the Henry Ford system? That's a great question, Matt. Thanks for that. And, you know, I would tell you that um, we had lots of collaboration. Um, I think one of the good things about the healthcare industry is that, generally speaking, most, most parts of the industry are, are willing to share with, with colleagues. And so, you know, again, whether it's on the provider side or on the payer side, I don't, I generally don't see, you know, scenarios where, um, where folks aren't willing to share. I mean, obviously, if there's competitive information, you know, we don't share that. But in terms of process that we can be helpful with. Um, I think that the short answer is absolutely, um, you know, and whether it's through formally through the Michigan Hospital Association, where there's a lot of collaboration going on. Um, we actually had uh, some newly formed COVID task forces of, in Southeast Michigan, where folks got together regularly to sort of talk about um, what they were seeing, what they were finding. I uh, would tell you that there was a group of, of CEOs uh, uh, that got together on a, on a, um, on an intermittent uh, basis to sort of talk about what's happening and what's not. When there was real crisis around bed capacity and around, you know, how do you create um, excess, excess capacity when, when uh, you know, ICUs were filling up or you needed additional COVID unit space. Uh, we had a lot of collaboration with, with, uh, with Michigan hospital leadership, Southeast Michigan hospital leadership in particular, because, you know, during the spring, most of the COVID drama was really in Southeast Michigan and the rest of the state, you know, happily for them, was not impacted the way we were. And so it, it was probably easier when it was confined to Southeast Michigan. Um, having said that now, you know, there are, are, are four systems that are regularly communicating as part of the governor's uh, economic recovery task force and sort of talking about what can we do to help support not only the recovery, but the, but the response to COVID. Um, and then, 
you know, honestly, on a daily basis, um, chief medical officers have a have a brief call around the state where they're talking about um, what we can do together. So there's a lot of collaboration here in the state, which is really helpful during a time like this. Great to hear. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the question, Matt. So, right, our time with you is up. The rest of us are going to stick around and do some fun networking, but I cannot thank you enough for the thoughtful conversation, the advice, and for all you do for the citizens of our state and for the DEC and for me personally in my role. So thank you for your time today, Wright. Steve, my pleasure, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with young leaders today. Have a great day. You too. Goodbye. Bye.